Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll profile Bentwood Baskets in Detroit Lakes. But first, joining me is Andy Peterson, the North Dakota Chamber of Commerce President. Andy, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's my honor. Now, as you join us today, you're also the Measure 2 opponent. Yes. So we'll be talking about that mostly during the show. But sure. as we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're originally from. You know, I'm originally from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Minnesota, but I have a long history in North Dakota. My great-grandparents immigrated from Norway to North Dakota and were farmers. My mother grew up here. Obviously, my grandparents grew up here. My grandfather spent 57 years working for the Great Northern Railway. Mm -hmm. So when the opportunity came to come to North Dakota and be part of it and adopt North Dakota as my home state, I jumped at it. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to be here. I've been here 20 months now, and I love everything about it. Now, how, how did you get involved with the chamber? Well, I have a long history in chamber work, and I worked for the Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce. And so, you know, it is, it's my profession. It's what I do. And so mm -hmm. for me, it was an opportunity and a golden one at that. So again, uh, chamber is my background, but okay. North Dakota is now my home. Okay. Well, let's talk about Measure 2 that will be on the ballot uh, yes. in June. Uh, of course, this has to do with the property taxes uh, yes. for the state of North Dakota. Can you talk about how the Chamber of Commerce has gotten so heavily involved with this issue? You know, this has been just a, a real journey for us. But when we saw this measure come up, we were concerned with it. And we were concerned really with what it would do to the business climate. North Dakota is rated pretty highly right now through the tax foundation as far as having a business climate. And some of that has to do with, you know, sales taxes being fairly reliable, the regu regulatory community being very, very reliable, and of course the income tax and corporate income tax being fairly, fairly reliable. We thought if Measure 2 passes, that could throw a lot of that into jeopardy because it creates chaos. It's a poorly written measure and as a result of that, we decided we better jump in and say, listen, let's have a talk about taxes in our state. We're all for lowering taxes. In fact, at the session last year, we were one of the, the group that led the charge to lower income and corporate taxes. But, you know, we, we jumped in to say, listen, this is a bad idea. It could throw all it into jeopardy. It could throw the business climate into jeopardy. And so that is our, our key to get in, in the fight. And uh, we're in it. Well, maybe you can be a little more specific because what do you believe would be the negative impact of Measure 2 if, if, if it's passed and, and uh, sure. how, how would it affect And, of course, you're saying all across the state, I guess. Well, on a couple of, couple of fronts. One is that it, it, it will impact the local governments, you know, and that's the bedrock of our society is local governments. We think local government is the best government. And if you take the control away from them, and effectively you will, because you'll take away their taxing authority and you'll send it to Bismarck and then Bismarck, of course, will have to send it back. So it would increase the liability and the power of the legislature. So that's first. And secondly, what will happen is that you know, taxes will likely have to shift. Y you know, the proponents of the measure will tell you that the state is hoarding money. And we've got a healthy surplus. We're one of few states in the nation that, that has a surplus, and I'm personally glad for that. But if you start taking that money and trying to meter it out, a lot of those monies are constitutionally put into place, so you can't use them. So, you know, likely you're going to have to raise other taxes. And the measure calls for raising, uh, using income and corporate taxes, sales taxes, those kinds of things. And so likely those taxes will have to be raised. If you're going to raise the, the sales tax to cover up the shortfall that this measure would create, you would have to double the sales tax. Double the sales tax. If you were going to rely solely on the corporate income tax, it would have to be raised somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 percent. Now, obviously, you know, I know that if the measure were to pass, the legislature would use a combination of those things. But those things in combination can still be deadly for the business climate. And when you're deadly with the business climate, what happens is, is that jobs escape, businesses move elsewhere. We don't want that to happen. We've worked so hard in North Dakota to make sure that we have a business climate that is one that businesses want to have. And so passing the measure, we think, is, is, is not a good thing. Well, 
Yeah, I know you, anybody who reads the paper sees a, a lot of different let, letters to the editor. Sure. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, the things written uh, on this, uh, in this across the state regarding this issue. And I guess I understand uh, proponents have accused your side of sort of distorting the facts and predicting the sky is falling. Uh, things like this. Uh, how do you respond to that? You know, let's just look at the numbers. Right now, they say that we have a five billion dollar surplus. And if you look at those numbers, you'll see that all of these funds are in there. And you either have to change the Constitution on two of them and make statutory changes on three other ones to make the numbers work, or you have to either cut spending at a dramatic amount or raise taxes. So you can say the sky is falling, and, and you know that's anybody's opinion. We're looking at the numbers. Right now, we have uh, $712 million that is unobligated. That would cover the first year of not having property taxes. But the second year, which is about the same amount, remember, in a biennium, we collect approximately $1.7 billion worth of property taxes. That $712 million won't cover the 1.7 anticipated loss of revenue. So there is no plan with the measure to replace that. So the proponents are either wanting to cut spending at a dramatic amount and or they're wanting to raise taxes. So again, we've got a fairly stable environment here. I'm not saying that taxes don't need a, a look at. I think we need to talk about where we want taxes to go in our state. But putting it into the Constitution, locking it up, and taking it away from the legislature and local governments, we think is a bad idea. Okay. You, you mentioned this just a moment ago, but can, can you talk some about sort of the, the result of putting, you know, all these funding decisions back in the hands of the state legislature, as, sure. as you talked about, and, and of course removing that control from school boards and city commissions. I mean, how you say it'll, it'll really impact and, and... You know, think about this. At the federal government, when we want something from the federal government, we go and, and we say, well, listen, let's, let's get a new bridge or let's get this project. Let's get the federal government to pay for it because it really, that, that's federal money. That's not coming out of our pockets. And so you remove the decision-making power from those who spend it. And you know as well as I do that when you spend money that someone else is, you're going to spend a lot more money. When you're in a local government and, a, and, and you see the mayor at, at the grocery store or at a church function or at a school function, you can approach the mayor or a city commissioner or a county commissioner or a township official and say, hey, what are you doing with that? Why are you spending it? So local government is always the most accountable. The state government is less accountable. And of course, if you put it into that model, what you'll have is you'll have people in Fargo making decisions for people in Wishick. Who do you think is going to win there? The people in Fargo are going to win because they have much more uh, power at the legislature than people in Wishick. Mm. Can you talk to, I mean, there, there's, you say there's not a sales tax provision, but that this measure would affect or could affect sales tax yes. and, and what that means and what that would be all about. Well, again, the legislature would be charged with coming up with either some kind of formula mm -hmm. or making sure that everyone is fully and properly funded as it's called for in the measure. Now, fully and properly funded is one thing to you and one thing to me. I remember having kids at home and my wife and I arguing about how much allowance they should get. Her fully and properly funding was $20 a week and my fully and properly funded was $2 a week. So you can imagine what would happen at the legislature. Every one of those 2,100 local subdivisions would have to come to Bismarck to make sure that they are fully and properly funded, whatever that means. Or there'd be some kind of formula that's based on what? That's not spelled out in this constitutional measure. That's to be determined by the legislature. So we're going to really have a food fight at the legislature to make sure that everybody gets their interests met rather than having those decisions made at the local government. So again, it, it really, it's the unintended consequences of this measure that is the, the thing that's the scariest and people should be concerned with. Government is never free and, you know, you have to invest in government to make it happen. So, again, we think those decisions are best made at local government whenever possible. You mentioned a little earlier about the legislature actually did address uh, taxes in the last yes. session. You know, do you think the citizens of North Dakota are, are overtaxed or when it comes to property taxes? Or has that been addressed or does it need addressing again? Well, it's all of the above. 
Yeah, the legislature did set aside some money to buy down local property taxes, and people's property taxes have either stayed the same, gone up slightly, or gone down because of, of that. And it, it's complicated, and it happens differently in all communities. But the legislature did put money aside for tax relief. So that's a good thing for property taxes. Uh, they did lower the income and the corporate taxes. So we think that was a good thing. Now, the other question that you ask is, are property taxes too high in North Dakota? It depends upon who you ask. To me, property taxes are investing in my community for streets, schools, parks, these kinds of things that are lifestyle things. Would I want my property taxes to go up? No. Should we take a long, hard look at property taxes in North Dakota? Absolutely. If Measure 2 passes, that's swept off the table. We won't have that discussion. We'll only have discussions about how to replace that money. So the answer to your question is we should look at it, but we should look at it through the process that's in place rather than a constitutional measure. Uh, can you expand a little bit more? You talked about the big business climate and businesses which you yeah. represent. Yes. And how that would how they would be impacted if Measure 2 passed. Well, and that's the part that we're concerned with because likely other taxes would go up, but we don't know how they would go up. So again, what businesses value is stability and a long-term look. And they want to know that when a regulator says this is going to happen, that it's going to happen fairly and honestly in that way. And they want to know what their tax liabilities are looking forward. If Measure 2 passes, again, we don't know how those things would change. And that's that uncertainty with businesses that they hate. So again, if you're going to the bank and borrowing money, the bank wants to know exactly how you're going to pay things back. It's the same thing with businesses. They want to know what that environment is going forward so they can make sensible and appropriate investments into their business, especially when they hire people. Okay. Can you talk some about the coalition, uh, coalition of groups that you've uh, yes. created across the state? You know, this is really an unusual coalition. Uh, we are in front of the coalition and proud to be there. But we have everybody from public sector groups like the teachers and the public employees to private sector groups uh, that are everybody from the, the uh, Cattlemen's Association to the Bankers Association. So all sorts of groups are here, both private and public. At last count, over 80 organizations are there. We represent over 200,000 North Dakotans that have come together in, a, in an historic proportion to say this is a bad measure. Now, just personally, the last time that the Greater North Dakota Chamber of Commerce and the Public Employees Association worked together, the executive director of the Public Employees Association wasn't born. So this is truly historic to have this many organizations come together representing a cross-section, a broad cross-section of North Dakotans and, and saying this is bad. So again, when the tax haters and the public employees come together, I think folks ought to pay attention. Well, I understand, of course, you've had a few public forums uh, yes. along the way, and, and I guess some of those have gotten a little heated uh, yes. when, when you've appeared uh, with, with proponents uh, of, uh, of the measure. Can you talk about these and whether there'll be any more bef before the election? You know, we've gone through a series of these that have happened from Bowman to Grand Forks and from Fargo to Williston. Uh, unfortunately, there won't be any more before mm -hmm. the, the primary, but they've, they've been heated at times. People feel passionately on both sides of it, but people have come out and, and had questions. It's been fun for me to see a group of 125 folks in garrison come out to talk about this measure. You know, that's really reflective of how people feel about this thing, both pro and con. Well, how about the lawsuit uh, that proponents have brought uh, against state officials accusing them of, of campaigning against the measure? Well, you know, the judge wrote in his summary of this that this read like a political uh, propaganda piece. So, you know, he dismissed it. It's not going to be heard at the appeals level before the uh, primaries heard, but we believe that it was simply an attempt by the proponents to silence any public officials out there to give their opinion. Now, if you elect somebody to public office, you want them to make the best decisions you can. And sometimes that calls for making an opinion. So we think that it's unfortunate that they brought this lawsuit. We think it's unjustified. 
and uh, we think it's a colossal waste of taxpayer money. If the measure does pass, is there a plan B alternative uh, to, to reinstitute property taxes or deal with it? You know, there there's not a plan B out there that I know of. I, I don't think people can make those plans until mm -hmm. it comes through, but know full well that people will rush to Bismarck because that's where the decisions will be made. Uh, I think what, what will happen then is a special session will be called into force because the measure takes effect January 1st, 2012. So we've already got six months behind us. So, you know, folks will rush to the scene and, and uh, we'll see what happens. It, it will be pandemonium. Well, I, I guess this is really a personal opinion. Are you confident that the measure will be defeated? You know, I think North Dakotans as a whole are a very reasonable group of folks. And they understand that you don't fund government on the cheap that you have to invest in government. You expect the best of your government and you expect them to provide a real dollar value for the taxes that are invested. At the end of the day, I think uh, sensibility will prevail and North Dakotans will reject this measure uh, flat out. Okay. Well, Andy, while you're here, uh, we'd like to know, can you tell us about uh, what what is or what does the North Dakota Chamber of Commerce do? Sure. The North Dakota Chamber of Commerce has been in existence for 85 years now. It was founded in Valley City by Herman Stern, and uh, we have, we are a business advocacy organization, and we have about 1,100 members across North Dakota and in towns both small and large. We have small business and large businesses, but we really are an advocacy group and we stand up for business and free enterprise in the state of North Dakota. Now, we also work with local chambers of commerce. We've got great ones all across the state and we work with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington, D.C. So we're part of a larger organization, but uh, we're a great one, we believe, and uh, we stand up for business whenever we can. Well, uh, you, you work out of Bismarck and uh, you yes. travel the state Pretty extensively by, by what we talked about before we came on air. In fact, you may mention that on your own. But can you can you tell the folks about how, you know, uh, cities are doing? It might not comes to mind with all the flooding we've had, be it in Devil's Lake or Valley City or yes. Fargo or wherever, and how the business climate is uh, with this, and especially Minot after Yeah, the yeah, let me just talk about flood. Minot. You know, there's a lot of small businesses that were devastated and a lot of big ones that were affected as well. Mm -hmm. The fortunate thing for Minot, and a flood is never fortunate. That's the last of the calamities that I ever want to experience. But the fortunate thing is that the business climate is pretty strong in our state, and it's very strong in Minot. So, you know, people aren't moving away because the jobs moved away. They've had to shift. They've had to make do, those kinds of things. And they've done incredible things up there, and Minot's coming back, and Minot will be back. So we're pretty proud of that. But across the state, the business climate is the best of all 50 states. North Dakota is ranked number one in job creation, and that's, that's above California. In fact, they, they've shed jobs and shed people. They've lost uh, two and a half million people in the last 10 years. North Dakota's gaining population, creating jobs. We have a lot of job openings. So things in North Dakota right now are looking up. Our unemployment rate is very, very slim. So it's a good thing in North Dakota. Speaking of that, you told me you traveled about 65,000 miles around yes. North Dakota? Yes. Last year, last year during the calendar year, I drove 65,000 miles, the vast majority of that in North Dakota. So it's really fun to get out and around North Dakota and to see all, all the towns and to visit with people and businesses. But yes, I travel a lot. I'm out about 125 nights a year. So I know North Dakota quite well. Well, that's probably the best way to get connected. If people want more information about Measure 2 or about uh, the Chamber, where can they go? Who can they contact? They can do two things. They can go to ndchamber.com or they can go to keepitlocalnorthdakota.com, either one, or call our office, 222-0929. Andy, thanks so much for joining us oh, today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Stay tuned for more. For centuries, Norwegian woodworkers built bentwood or tina boxes to store their food, tools, or valuables. Preserving that Scandinavian tradition captured the heart of a Detroit Lakes, Minnesota craftsman. Robert Hoover spent years learning and perfecting the construction of tina boxes and is now passing on what he knows to other woodworkers.
I've always kind of been interested in a little bit of wood. One winter, there was an old timer that lived in town that had immigrated from Norway, and I asked him if he'd be willing to teach me some of his crafts, uh, of which was the Tina box, the bent wood boxes. What intrigued me about this is how well constructed they are, how the, the craftsmanship is very good. I mean, if you've seen a couple of these here, they're just gorgeous when they're done. Work around the uh, handle on the other one. No, that's all right. But see how, how we're bringing that down in there so that it's going to seal right up it's to it? seal it, yep. Right there. You can take a three-quarter inch board and you need to check the grain of the wood to make sure it'll allow you to, to, to bend it. That's holding pretty good there. You know, I bend the rings up before I come for this class because they need to be dried, but they do the rest of it. Tina is, is it's spelled T-I-N-E, it's like a girl's name. A lot of the boxes are made with a heart pattern on the front. Some of them have crushed velvet on it. Some of the guys in my class are using birch bark in the heart. The first one I uh, made was, um, just had a single heart. It was, I made that for my wife, Bonnie. Uh, the second one was for my daughter, Jennifer. That actually is, a, I haven't put the uh, urethane on this one yet, but that's a two heart theme. And uh, the one that I'm working on for my daughter, Julia, is three hearts, as you can see. The Tina boxes from the old country were used for storage of anything that, can, that you want to keep around. A lot of times they were used as lunch boxes where they could take their bread, cheese, sausage out in the field that they were hanging hay on the, on the line to dry, or, or you know, so that the, the rodents and the critters couldn't get in there. And I like to do the caning on the boxes primarily before we glue the bottoms in, because then you can work from both sides. So we're gonna go right in the middle with an awl and split that like that. Then I put a point on this end so that when we come back through here, you pull the awl out and you run this cane through at the same time so it comes through the hole. And you need five and a half links simply because it's lacing through itself several times as it goes down. In the old country, they used to use spruce root or birch root. And I've made boxes out of bird's eye maple, the soft maple, a birch boards, and I've made a tina box out of birch bark, which is called a nevatina. A lot of them were used in the kitchen to store rice, tea, coffee, beans. A favorite was a schmear box, schmear box, butter box. So we'll cut this one off and plane it down. Let's, let's go down to 10 millimeters for the, for the bottom. So. Then we're gonna go on the outside and we're gonna draw all the way around that. I had a piece of bird's eye maple one time and the guy at the lumber yard said, well, if you're gonna try and bend it, the eyes will pop out. But they didn't. And it was a three quarter inch board. And, and I actually made three Tinas out of that one, where I used the bird's eye maple for the side of the box. And then I used the soft maple for the covers and posts. It was beautiful. And the, the eyes just glowed in the, in the wood when you got it finished. We put glue in the bottom groove of the bottom of the box. Put the, put the box on there, and we want it to dry. So we'll drill a couple of holes, and then we'll peg, and then we'll work our way around. I like to put a little bit in there, see if it'll fill in, and then I just notch it on either side, and then we just snap that off. See, in most of the boxes I make, I make it so that the bottom board of, in, that I'm using on the box is recessed up into the box, so it makes it nice and firm. We could start doing this to alleviate, there were a couple little notches okay. there. This particular box is called a, a key box because there is a key in the corner that holds the cover down, and the cover then comes up, and it's pegged on the other side. This particular Tina box is made out of basswood, and it's one that my wife painted. 
And you see the heart pattern in the front of the Tina because a lot of the Tina boxes were made for sweethearts or something like that. I've heard the story that if you want, wanted to get engaged to a gal, you would make a nice Tina box and leave it on her doorstep. Come back the next morning, if the Tina box was gone, you knew she accepted you. If not, she rejected you, and you wouldn't give that Tina box to a different girl at that point. So as the story goes, beware the man with many Tinas. But this way is doing it all the way around. <laughs> I go out in the shop, and sometimes I work till mi after midnight, and don't even realize it's late, you know. Time just goes nice when you're doing it. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008 and by the members of Prairie Public. <music>